You know, from a preacher's point of view, um, I think whatever message is provided, and it is the Word of God, it's, it's important. Uh, but I think there are some messages that hold a little bit more importance than others. And for me, this is one of those messages that are a little more important than others. Um, I want to begin this morning, first off, with a prayer, and then we'll, we'll dig into our study. My Father, we are so grateful for this day and these dear people that have, you have uh, provided us uh, the opportunity to assemble together, and that uh, we are your people. We, uh, we have assembled with one another to you, before you, for you, because of you. And Lord, we are, are so needy, uh, and we are so expecting uh, not only of the Lord's return, but of the Spirit of God to work in our hearts in ways that only God can. And so we once again call upon the Holy Spirit to open up minds and hearts to the great truths of your word, who you have authored. Through Jesus, we give you thanks and we pray. Amen. So we begin this morning by reviewing and getting the basic understanding of spiritual gifts. Everyone upon being born of God, what we call salvation, is actually baptized or immersed totally into the body of Christ. We call it the church. The Holy Spirit has come to indwell and to live within each and every believer who has received Jesus Christ, making each one a child of God. Now, with the Holy Spirit and his presence in a believer's life, what should we expect in you? What should we expect in a believer's life? What does he do in our day-to-day -day living? Well, let me suggest a few things. Number one, he becomes your guide. He is your truth teacher. He becomes your power supply. We walk, we live, we pray, we are filled, we bear fruit, and we are given gifts for ministering. All stemming from trusting Christ and the indwelling Holy Spirit, and being part of the body of Christ. The Holy Spirit is so important, so important, that Scripture tells us we are not to grieve Him, we are not to quench Him, and we are not to resist Him. That makes a message like this, to me, extremely important, extremely important. How vital, then, it is to operate under a spirit-dominated control life. Does such a life imply change? Absolutely. Absolutely. Does that mean you become religious? Absolutely not. Absolutely not. That's not what the Spirit of God does. He doesn't make you religious. Does he change your personality? Do you become a fanatic? No, no. <laughs> There's a lot of strange ideas about what the spirit-led life actually means. To sum it up, a spirit life means becoming like Christ. Simple, right? Or if you really need to get one word, holiness. Holiness. What's a spirit-led life? holiness. Is that something man can achieve apart from God? Surely not. Can't happen. Progressive sanctification or growing in the grace and knowledge of Christ comes from a yielded life to the Word and Holy Spirit. Let me just give you a couple of verses here. One is Ezekiel. This is an Old Testament passage. I will put my spirit within you and cause you to walk in my statutes and you will keep my judgments and do them. It's his work. 
It's his work. He must do it. And Galatians 5.16, we must yield to that. I say, walk in the spirit and you shall not fulfill the lust of the flesh. A spirit-led life means holiness, but it also means something else. Things that we find in Ecclesiastes and Psalms and Galatians, and here's what we have. For God gives wisdom and knowledge and joy to a man who is good in his sight. Psalm 4, 7. You have put gladness in my heart more than in the seasons that were grain and wine increased. Galatians 5, 22, 23. But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, long-suffering, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. And such there is no law. There are some things that God gives that are outside of ourselves. Godly wisdom, godly knowledge, godly fruit, godly joy. A joy that comes not only with the good, but actually with the snowstorms, the bad. And that's God doing in a yielded life. In a yielded life. A spirit-led life also brings liberty. And this is not the liberty to go and do whatever one likes or freedom from restraint and obligations. It's freedom to live a loving relationship with God himself. That's where it begins. That's where true freedom begins with a loving relationship with God himself. Romans 8, 14 and 15 says this, For as many as are led by the Spirit of God, they are the sons of God. For you did not receive the spirit of bondage again to fear, but you received the spirit of adoption, by whom we cry, Abba, Father. You see, it's with God himself. It's a liberty and deliverance from sin, Romans 6, 7. For he who has died has been freed from sin. And we die in Christ when you receive him. There's also a deliverance from the law, Romans 7, 6. But now we have been delivered from the law, having died to what we were held by so that we should serve in the newness of the Spirit, and not in the oldness of the letter. A whole change of principle has been established. Deliverance from bondage, 7.6 says this, deliverance from bondage uh, of corruption uh, of self and death, Romans 8.2. For the law of the spirit of life in Christ has made me free from the law of sin and death death. A spirit-led life truly brings liberty. It brings also a great confidence, a great confidence. Hebrews 2.15. And release those who fear of death were all their lifetime subject to bondage. The fear of death no longer threatens in the spirit of God. 1 Corinthians 9.19 for though I am free from all men, I have made myself a servant to all, that I might win the more. While Paul was willing to conform to the customs of other people for the gospel's sake, they actually held no authority over him. He would change to the customs. He would honor the customs, but they did not hold an authority over him. 1 Corinthians eleven sixteen. But if anyone seems to be contentious, we have no such custom, nor do the churches of God. Colossians 2.20. Therefore, if you died with Christ for the basic principles of the world, why, as a living in the world, do you subject yourself to regulations? You see, in the spirit, believers have been released 
from the ritualistic observances of men and should not let others bind them or bring them down under those things again. We have liberty in the spirit and word of God from false ordinances, from lies, and from false teachers as well. People look for truths and freedom, but they never find it because they look in all the wrong places. It is only found in the Word and Spirit of God. That's where freedom truly is found. And this can bring confidence and rest Although the world knocks you down and crushes you, you have the confidence and can stand on the rock-solid foundation of Christ, who is the truth, the way, and the life of God. You have a confidence that you are somebody. No matter what anyone else thinks, you are somebody. You are a child of the King of Kings who never leaves you and someone who cares for you and provides for you. You are someone who is loved. Someone who is needed and has a purpose in life. Each and every one of you in Christ are special in God's eyes, in God's eyes, and in, are indwelt by Him individually. Therefore, a spirit left life brings victory. Sin and Satan have been beaten, death has been swallowed up. You are not a loser, you are not strange. You are not a geek. No matter what the world has to say. 1 John 5, 4 says this, For whoever is born of God overcomes the world, and this is the victory that overcomes the world, even your faith. You are an overcomer. An overcomer. And you are overcomer in the Spirit of God. You are also a servant. A Spirit-led life is a life of servant. It's a serving ministry. A service to the body of Christ. So, we now have come first circle... And we are now entering into spiritual gifts thinking again. Now, here's some important questions that I want to give to you. Because this is, I've kind of given you a lot of preliminary to get you here. How can you understand what your gift or gifts are? What is your ministry in the body of Christ. What exactly is your service to the church? Now let me me simply say this. All these questions are secondary. Did you get that? All these questions are secondary. This whole study on spiritual gifts is not to categorize Christians and their gifts. Let me say that again. This whole study on spiritual gifts is not to categorize Christians and their gifts. A a definition of gifts are important in understanding that you have one or more gifts and to know what they mean and how they function in today's world, and so that you won't be sucked in to that which is wrong, that which is confusing, and that which is is a misinterpretation of Scripture. But gifts on the whole are a little elusive. Gifts on the whole are elusive. 
What is important is that the Spirit of God is to dominate your life. Now, I'm trying to put things in the right perspective. Yield your heart and life to the Word and Spirit, who will then minister through you. Look for opportunities and watch how he actually uses you. You can then look back and say, no, I just really did not function well in this area. Or I could say, hey, that's how the, that's how the Spirit gifted me. We don't want to be overly concerned about definitions or exact gifts because so much of the gifts overlap. I'm taking them one by one so that we know what they are, but the combination of gift mixes are actually staggering. That is why many evaluations for giftedness don't work for some people. Now, I am not against the evaluations. I, I am not saying they don't help some people. But I am saying that they don't work for everybody. If our efforts, though, is to understand gifts, is reduced to what gift you have, you'll miss the whole point. You will just miss the whole point. A spirit-filled life will show you your area of service. That's my point. A spirit-filled life will show you your service. That might include speaking gifts. It might include serving gifts, offices in the church, and leadership gifts. Now think of it like this. Have you ever seen an artist hold in one hand a flat board... You know, they have this kind of an odd-shaped thing. They hold this board. And on this board, there's splotches of colors. Right? You might have blue. You might have green. You might have red. You might have white and black. All, all kind of different splotches of colors. Now, by illustration, the gifts we, we have and the gifts we've studied are basic colors from which God takes his spiritual gift paintbrush, dabs them into the basic colors to combine or to make other shades of colors and gives them to you. So he takes some blue and he takes some red and he takes some white and he gives it to you. And he takes some green and he takes some red and he takes some white and he gives them to you. And he takes some black, and he takes some white, and he gives them to you. Or, we might look at this as you would a Tiffany lamp shade. And I don't know how many people know what a Tiffany lamp shade is, but it's usually cut glass, and it's multicolored. So, take this Tiffany lampshade with its multiple colors and its glasses with one central white light that emanates through the whole shade to produce an array of colors. The colored glass are the gift. The central white light is the Holy Spirit. And God has primarily gift listed in scriptures from these, these glass colors and shines the light, and they're multifaceted. Therefore, the exact definition becomes hard to find. Now, some have very dominant gifts. So when you take an evaluation and you have a dominant gift, that comes, that comes out. So that's where your evaluation can be really helpful. If you have a dominant gift... But what happens if you don't have a dominant gift? What happens if you have a gift mix? 
and there are no dominant gifts. Wonder if I have mercy and I have administration and I have leadership or what, what happens if none of those are really dominant? And so the evaluation becomes really frustrating for you because you can't really find what your gift is. What is important, though, is that the Holy Spirit shines through you. Whatever pane of glass you are, whatever color you are, whatever color mix you are, that the Holy Spirit is the one who's working through you. Some may be dominant in one, others may have no one gift that is dominant but a mixture. Therefore, you are the gift. You become the gift by how the Holy Spirit has equipped you for building up the body of Christ. Does that make sense? And I hope this is helpful. Now, in our study, I, I, have, I mentioned we've been going through them one at a time. We have gone through five speaking gifts. Prophecy proclaims the truth. Knowledge clarifies the truth. Wisdom applies the truth. Teaching imparts the truth. Exhortation demands truth be obeyed through encouragement. All related to speaking God's word. Then we had some serving gifts. We have covered thus far, we've covered helps, we've covered mercy, and we have covered faith. Okay, so if these were major colors on our art board, and God took prophecy, and he took, oh, let's say mercy, and he took faith, he would mix that together, and he might make a dominant one out of that. He, he might make a particular gift dominant out of those, and then give that to you. That's yours. And you become unique. You become special. There's no one like you. And that's why you become important to me. And you become important to others. Because there's no one that is exactly like you. So we want to go on, and we're going to go on in our, in our serving gifts, and we're going to go to, and we're going to gear up for the service uh, to the body of Christ from Romans 12, 8. Okay, so I wanted to give what I considered something very, very important in relation to the Spirit of God, and understanding gifts. And now we're going to go back to just singling out one particular gift so we can understand this particular gift. And this gift comes from Romans 12, 8. Romans 12, 8. He who exhorts in exhortation, he who gives with liberality, he who leads with diligence. That's our gift for today. Scripture teaches the universal priesthood of believers, which puts all on the same level, having equal access to God, right? That's important because I'm giving you balancing truths to what I'm going to give you. These are important because remember I said the Bible is wonderfully balanced. Scriptures, I mean, uh, Christians often are not wonderfully balanced. But scripture is. So we're giving you the balance now. We are priests of God. And which puts all on the same level, having equal access to God himself. We need no priest. We need no clergy. You need, you need no minister interceding in our behalf. A saved person may boldly enter into the throne of grace by the blood of Jesus Christ. Amen? This is important. Also, there is no such thing as a clergy and laity in the body of Christ. 
It is an organism, a living organism, not an organization. It's not a business structure. It is an organism. There is no caste system in the church. All who are saved are one with Jesus Christ and one with each other. There is no spiritual elite with God, nor is there spiritual inequality before God. Galatians 3, 8. Okay. <clears throat> there's neither, no, uh, 20, I'm sorry. There's neither Jew nor Greek, there's neither slave nor free, there's neither male nor female, for you are all one in Christ Jesus. Isn't that great? That, that is great. This verse asserts that all people equally can become God's heirs and recipients of his eternal promises. This verse, however, does not deny that God has designed for ethnic, social, and sexual distinctions among people or that equal access to God is incompatible with the God-ordained roles of headship and submission in the church, in society, or in family. God has provided among equals spiritual gifts for leadership. The Holy Spirit urges that that those who lead should do it with diligence. In 1 Corinthians, he includes among the gifts administration, 1228. Now be assured, when the church gathers, there will be those among us who will lead. Having been given a spiritual gift for that very purpose. Now this is not to digress into a clergy, a laity system. Three main words are used with reference to church leadership. Two verbs and one noun. Two verbs, one noun. The verb proestemi means to stand before, in rank, to preside, or to practice, maintain, or to be over, or rule. It is translated leads, and it is found in Romans 12, 8 that we read this morning. The Holy Spirit does provide for some to actually lead in his church. This verb also refers to a father leading in his family. 1 Timothy 3, 5, and 12. For if a man does not know how to rule his own house, how will he take care of the church of God? Let deacons be husbands of one wife, ruling their children and their own houses well. This also, this verb also, is in regards to those who are, have the carrying offices of the church, holding the church in its care. First Thessalonians. And we urge you, brethren, to recognize those who labor among you and are over you in the Lord and admonish you and to esteem them very highly for love, uh, in love for their work's sake, but be at peace among yourselves. That's one verb. The second word, a noun, kubernesis, is used of a gift of administration in 1 Corinthians 12, 28, which not only gives us our English word cybernetics, but also is a closely, in a closely related form, is translated master, meaning helmsman or steersman. 
in Acts 20, uh, 27, 11. And shipmaster in Revelation 18, 17. You see, the church ship needs a captain with the gift of piloting. The third word, again a verb, means to command, judge, rule over, have authority over. It is translated governor, referring to Joseph over all of Egypt in Acts 7.10, ruler in Matthew 2.6, and chief in Acts 15.22. It is used three times in Hebrews in reference to church leaders. Hebrews 13, 7, 17, and 24. Now these verses refer to elders of a local church. 1 Timothy 5, 17. Now, if I left off here, we would get an out of balance view of leadership. If you just use these verses, you would get an out of view view of leadership, which many have, leading to dictatorial rule or a hierarchy status or tremendous salaries or bowing and kissing rings and kissing feet and bowing before, all these which are totally unbiblical. Now, they're out there in Christendom. They are out there in Christendom, but they're unbiblical. Now, putting in perspective, the pilot of a ship is not the owner, but a steward. So we look up a very important verse from 1 Peter 5, 1 through 3. The elders who are among you, I exhort. I am also a fellow elder and a witness of the suffering of Christ, and also a partaker of the glory that will be revealed. Shepherd the flock of God which is among you, serving as overseer, not by compulsion, but willingly, not for dishonest gain, but eagerly, not as being lords over those entrusted to you, but being examples to the flock. You see, Christian leadership is never dogmatic, demagogic, or dictatorial. Spiritual authority exercises itself in wisdom, in tact, examples, humility, and service. The church belongs to Jesus Christ. The one with the gift of leading or administration is Christ's steward. And there is nothing to indicate that this gift is limited to elders. Many often behave as though most of the gift reside in the pastor or the elders with the only one gift remaining for the congregation, and that being the gift of giving to pay the bills. That is not how it works. This is simply not true. You can find many with administrative leading gifts in evangelism, in visitation, in music, in education, in missions, each leading various groups in a local assembly. People with a gift have the ability to make plans and launch projects uh, to meet future needs, to set goals, to execute plans, and then review their ministry. The gift of leading or administration comes, comes with the ability to make wise decisions and to mobilize, motivate, and direct others toward an objective, obedient application of a Scripture. This is not for manipulating people to get them to do what you want them to do, but leading them in the things of the Lord. Let me just turn to a biblical example and then we will close. 
Exodus 18. And so it was on the next day that Moses sat to judge the people, and the people stood before Moses from morning until evening. So when Moses' father-in-law saw all that he did for the people, he said, What is this thing that you are doing for the people? Why do you alone sit and all the people stand before you from morning until evening? And Moses said to his father-in-law, Because the people come to me to inquire of God. When they have a difficulty, they come to me, and I judge between one and another, and I make known the statutes of God and his laws. So Moses' father-in-law said to him, this thing that you do is not good, but you and these people who are with you will surely wear yourselves out, for this thing is too much to, for, for you. You are not able to perform it by yourself. Listen now to my voice. I will give you counsel and God will be with you. Stand before God for the people so that you may bring the difficulties to God. And you shall teach them the statutes and laws and show them the way in which they must walk and work they must do. Moreover, you shall select from all the people able men such as fear God, men of truth, hating covetousness, a place such over them to be rulers of thousands, rulers of hundreds, rulers of fifties, and rulers of tens, and let them judge the people at all times. Then will be an even greater matter that they shall bring to you, but every small matter they themselves shall judge, so it will be easier for you, for they, shall, for they will bear the burden with you. If you do this thing, and God so command you, then you will be able to endure, and all the people will also go to their place in peace. Now Moses was the designated leader, called of God, and mightily used. Now if you ever need a good example of a good leader, Moses is the man. A humble man, a servant of God. If you ever need a good definition of a leader, you have found it in verse 20. Verse 20. And you shall teach them the statutes and laws and show them the way in which they must walk and the work they must do. That's what a leader should do. But Moses could not do it alone. Verse 21. There were others from among the congregation who were also spiritually qualified to lead. God did not remove Moses, but for the sake of Moses and the people, there needed to be others to participate. There are sometimes people in a, in, in, who are in leadership in a church can be bogged down with so many different issues that they never get anything accomplished because there's people who should be leading in the congregation. They need to lead with diligence. Romans 12 eight, which means with eagerness, carefulness, forwardness, and haste. If they see a need, they're to act quickly. If they saw a problem, it was not to go to any longer than it needed to be necessary, they were to do it. They were to get things organized so as not to have confusion. The Holy Spirit knows what each local church needs to be built up in. This then means as you and I yield ourselves to the Word and Spirit of God, He will use the gift given to each one of you to minister to one another. Much like the many parts of a human body to keep us healthy, growing, and functioning as he intended. The key to all this this morning, the key to everything that I've said today, is a spirit-filled life. A spirit-filled life of service, and you will see how the Lord uses you. Let's pray.